Welcome and thank, thank you for joining us today. You're one of the 300 people attending BICOL first webinar in a series on artificial intelligence and the future of regulation. In this first webinar, we're going to focus on artificial intelligence and data governance in the COVID-19 context. Lord Clement Jones, who among many other titles and roles has led the House of Lords work on artificial intelligence, and is the chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence, will lead a conversation with experts in the field. We have today Carly Kine, the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute, Professor Lillian Edwards of Newcastle Law School, Mark Findlay, the director of the Center of Artificial Intelligence and Data Governance at Singapore Management University, is also a big honorary research fellow on artificial intelligence, and Professor Pete Fassi of Access University. Um, I'm sure you are by now even too familiar with Zoom webinars, but uh, uh, just a reminder that people in the audience are now visible or audible. And I'm now handing over to Lachlan and Jones, um, who will lead a conversation for the next hour. We are taking questions from the audience, so please type your question in the question and answer box. You can also interact with questions that others are asking and upvote them. During the last half an hour, our speaker will answer your, uh, your questions. And over to, to you, Tim, now. Irena, thank you very much and welcome, everybody. Um, and thank you very much to the British Institute of International and Comparative uh, Law for organising this conversation. And I'm absolutely delighted that we've got Carly, Lillian, Mark and uh, Pete with us today uh, to talk us through some of the issues. And as you've seen from the rubric um, uh, set out in the invitation, what we're really um, talking about is uh, uh, some of the data uh, uh, issues surrounding uh, the COVID-19 uh, tracing applications, the question of storing, uh, use of personal data, and the public health effectiveness uh, of these applications, which require public trust, and uh, uh, many of us would argue a clear and specific regulatory context. Um, and so it isn't so much about the technical aspects we're gonna be talking about today, you know, centralized versus decentralized, uh, and so on, but it's about the ethical, social, and legal scrutiny, uh, which is particularly appropriate, particularly um, against the emerging context of some of these public-private partnerships uh, that are emerging in the development of some of these apps and, and uh, tracing mechanisms. And so our uh, discussants, our conversation today, uh, will very much focus on some of those AI uh, governance and data issues uh, against the context of a national uh, pandemic um, and, of course, the need for uh, international and, and cross-border uh, collaboration. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, with Carly Kind, who's the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute, and we're delighted to see you, Carly, because we know that, uh, uh, well, the, first of all, the Ada Lovelace has got a new chair. Uh, we're very pleased to see that Dame Wendy Hall um, has been uh, nominated and appointed, um, which is great news. Uh, we know you're going to have uh, a terrific uh, chair of the uh, of the Institute's board, um, uh, but also the Ada Lovelace has been working very hard on a number of reports in this area um, uh, and keeping us all informed really about many of the, uh, not only the technicalities, but also some of the legal and regulatory issues as we go along. Um, so over to you. Thank you, Tim. And yeah, we're thrilled to have Wendy join. She's obviously a, um, a very respected figure in, the, in conversations around data but, and also trust and trustworthiness of, of data-driven systems. So I think she'll bring a lot to the Institute. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, and I, I want to see what, seize on something that you've just said there, Tim, which is around um, a kind of outsized focus on the technical, which I think we arguably have seen in recent weeks um, when it comes to, in particular, the contact tracing app. But I don't think that the technical can be entirely excised from the social, or the legal and the ethical, of course, because one of the reasons people have been focusing on the technical questions around centralised versus decentralised, which is essentially a conversation around just how private and secure the data will be, um, is because uh, the, the privacy of the system links very closely to how trusted it will be. And trust is really central to ensuring the effectiveness of uh, any digital intervention around COVID. And I think it's important not to, um, to disconnect those two issues. 
But from the perspective of the Ada Lovelace Institute, we started looking at um, the use of data and data-driven technologies around the COVID crisis from the point of view which said where technology can make responses to this crisis better, quicker, more effective, it should be used, absolutely. And we are in a privileged position for the first time ever to be able to use data and technology in new ways to respond to a pandemic. We've never before had the technical capabilities to respond to a global crisis like this before. So let's start from the point that we should use technology and we should use data. But we must, um, we must make sure that any use of technology and use of data is effective, accurate, um, consistent with public expectations and the public interests, consistent with human rights norms and other legal requirements, and, and importantly, deserving of the public's trust. So it's not only trust trusted, it's trustworthy. And I think we, uh, we, when, we, when we started from that perspective, we found a, a number of initial considerations that link to um, kind of uh, legal, um, legal safeguards, technical questions, but also societal and behavioral questions that really gave us pause and um, led us to a conclusion that there wasn't sufficient evidence to support the rollout of a digital contact tracing app at the time we published our report three weeks ago. Um, whether or not that evidence has now surfaced, I think is a different question. Um, I, I'm just gonna highlight some of the ethical, legal and, um, and technical and logistical limitations of digital contact tracing app, just to set the scene for this conversation. So I think um, that people are familiar with the centralized versus decentralized conversation. That is, is the data stored uh, um, in a distributed manner on an individual's phone? Or is it stored centrally or something in between? There's also um, questions around the technical limitations of the technology itself. So how good is Bluetooth at detecting distance between two devices? Um, does it work? Does the app work when you're using other apps on your phone, on various versions of your phone, et cetera? Could an app be vulnerable to fraud or, and abuse? So could an individual uh, falsely use an app? Could a, a mo motivated actor um, hack into the system? Um, so those are kind of technical questions that we feel that weren't resolved certainly when we started talking about this conversation and I think arguably haven't really been resolved um, in the meantime. And part of that is due to the absence of evidence being put in the public domain about uh, the way in which the app has been tested and the results of those tests. I think there's also a separate set of barriers to the effective deployment of the app, which relate to the, its ubiquity. So we, we hear often in the news reporting that in order for digital contact tracing to be truly effective, a certain percentage of the population must download and use the app. And modeling shows that in order for it to be effective in suppressing the virus, that threshold is 60% of the population or 80% of smartphone users. It's true that numbers less than that will have some benefit, but there's still a question mark about what is the floor, what is the minimum threshold necessary that has to be exceeded in terms of use in order for the app to be effective. I think that's still a big question and it hasn't been answered in public. There's of course questions around public trust and confidence. And then there's also questions around potentially harmful, harmful behavioral impacts. So will, what do we know about whether or not people will be less likely to be alert or comply with social distancing measures if they're using an app? And how can we test that and satisfy ourselves to a degree of reliability before the app is rolled out? Rolled out? And then there's social considerations around potential exclusion of vulnerable groups, exacerbation of health inequalities. So those who are less likely to have a mobile phone may also be those who are more likely to suffer from the ill effects of the virus due to a range of factors around social inequality um, and social uh, problems, uh, social experiences of health. There is a question around social and financial support for people using the app. So if you're told to isolate um, by the app, what can you expect from your employer if you need to take seven to 14 days off work? And is there a sufficient safety net there? And then social considerations around criminality and scams. So we go into all of these um, issues in slightly more depth in a report that we published called Exit Through the App Store. And then uh, subsequently, we've published something called Provisos for a Contact Tracing App, which set out the range of things that would need to be established in the public domain. I won't go into any more detail on those given the time, but just at a high level, that's around demonstrating the efficacy of the app, developing legislation and a broader strategy, and hopefully Lillian can talk to that. Um, uh, and on the efficacy point, I think Pete's going to speak to the, the trials and how we should demonstrate the um, 
the impact of testing. And then finally around building trust and developing a clear communication strategy. And I will end on this point, which is, um, I think technology can do a lot of good here, but it still feels as if there's not sufficiently clear communications and transparency around things like, what is the ethics advisory board um, considering in its, uh, in its deliberations? What are their findings? What is the findings from the tests? How will that be monitored and evaluated during its implementation and how will new changes be made going forward? I'm sorry, I know that was a bit of a whistle stop tour of all of the things that we, uh, we looked at, but I just wanted to kind of lay the, lay the landscape as we start into this interesting discussion. Well, you've certainly, uh, certainly raised one or two issues, Carly, I may say. I mean, it's really interesting because in a sense, this is um, uh, a really good exemplar uh, of where if you don't get it right, you don't gain public trust. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, you, you know, we've talked, I suppose, in, 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 you know, quite a lot of areas about the new technology, what one needs to do in terms of getting public trust, transparency, mm -hmm. explainability, and freedom from bias and so on. And this COVID-19 app almost crystallizes a lot of those issues all in one place uh, going forward. But if you if you had to learn one lesson out of this COVID-19 app amongst all those, mm. you know, different considerations, which, you know, let's face it, uh, are pretty, pretty heavy. Um, mm. uh, what, which, which of all of them would you draw in order to retain that public trust? That's a very, very good question. Um, I, I think you're right that this, it does exemplify all of the issues and challenges of doing technology development at pace that governments face. And actually, it's much more problematic in the context of this app than it would be in another situation. Because as you, as you alluded to, Tim, getting it wrong first time can't really be overcome because you, once you lose public trust, you can't rebuild it or it would be very difficult to rebuild it in the context of this app. And because the app requires on so many people, you know, it relies on so many people using it, that is a really careful balance to be struck. I think in terms of one lesson to be learned, there's something about um about uncertainty and and being being very um open about the risks and the the kind of lack of certainty that it exists in the development of technology i think keeping things in um in kind of beta form for as long as possible building as much time for testing and elaborating and iterating um which is i you know i accept hugely difficult in the context of a, a pandemic where there's an immense time pressure to to develop something, but I think that time pressure has um, incentivized decisions to be made that it, on reflection, if more time had been built in, they would, they would not have made. And so there's something about building in time and space to iterate, get it right, get it wrong, and, and go back and fix it, rather than kind of barreling ahead that I think we need to learn for future um, public sector developments of technology. Thank you, um, and we'll come we'll come back to that um, uh, in our in our conversation. But what you said about the uh, the, the uh, ethics advisory board of the uh, uh, for NHSX app and so on, of course, is extremely apposite because uh, we have Professor Lillian Edwards as our next uh, uh, conversant and uh, of Newcastle Law School, but uh, she's also on the NHSX. Uh, ethics advisory board uh, in respect to this app um, and I'm sure we'll have a view about some of the things you've said Lillian. Hi um, yes um, before we get on to discussing the ethics advisory board and which I obviously have to re remain confidential um, I'd like to talk a bit about the point I think you raised in the very beginning about whether this is a techno solutionist debate um, and this is a point I've been banging on about that so much heat and light has been expended on the discussion about centralized against decentralized and sure decentralized has become a proxy for saying respectful of your privacy and prevent scope creep and that's all good. But it isn't the answer to everything and I was kind of disquieted during some of this debate by some of the statements that came out, for example, rather nomically code is truth from Ian Levy um, in his rather famous blog about security and privacy. Well, code may be truth, but law is power. Um, and I really wanted to bring to the fore the idea that we are concentrating on computer code and in Lessig's um, statement, we should also be thinking about law as code because there are things where you do need legal safeguards. And you know, just to be prosaic data protection lawyer, I love data protection, but it is not the answer to everything. And as Carly was indicating, 
there are lots of social uh, deprivation, discrimination, power, coercion, due process issues associated with the potential and actual use of these acts, which are not, in my view, at least obviously dealt with by data protection. So to that extent, I don't know what happened there. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. I began to draft um, several weeks back now a model safeguards bill, coronavirus safeguards bill, and assembled a very useful team, including Carly, to comment on it. Thank you, Carly. Um, and we came up with a number of main suggestions, which have altered as time has gone on. And there is a link to the bill, which is a work in progress. And you can have that link if you just Google it or can be supplied at the end. Um, so, firstly, obviously, um, I think there should be a clear statement in law, however much we think this could never happen, that no one should be penalised for not having a smartphone. As Carly has indicated, it is likely to be the most deprived, the most disempowered, the poorest, the oldest, um, who are likely to be in that category, and there's no way that they should be disempowered, either in terms of their health needs not being met or indeed in any kind of compulsion. Right? That takes me to my second and I think major point that I tried to make in the bill, which is when we're going to have the app in a week or so, I think, um, at least as partial rollout, um, at that point, there is going to be a tremendous motivation, I think, to get this 60% um, of the population, 80% of smartphone users up. There's also going to be a considerable and understandable interest of certain employers, people who run public spaces, Eventually, when things reopen, places like gyms or healthcare or shopping malls or all these kind of places. So are we going to see a world in which people are compelled to install these apps and more so to display the results of the apps, to pass on the information, to pass on the guidance, which may, remember, be wrong, right? There's going to be a high chance, in fact, and we don't know how high that chance is, of false positives or false negatives because at the moment, to a large extent, we're relying on self-reported symptoms, and it's not entirely clear yet how those will be replaced with actual test results, right? So there's considerable potential here for social inequality and discrimination and error, I, I would say. Um, and therefore, within the bill, we did make a plain statement that no one should be compelled to install a contact tracing app or indeed to share the messages of their status on such an app on request. Now that is a contentious statement. You can say this is all about having as many people having this information, sharing this information. Um, so originally, in the original drafting of the of the bill, we said that there should be a propor proportionality assessment here instead, that it should be possible to mandate installation or display, but only if it was transparent and proportionate to the legitimate aim of defeating the virus, right? But then, oddly enough, and I found that a very difficult choice, I think the team found that a very difficult choice, um, the Australians came out with their app and they came out with a bill of safeguards, somewhat out of the blue, it was quite remarkable actually. And within it, they, and it's a very similar app to the UK app, it should be said, it's centralised, it collects data within the central server. They simply said, no, no, there shan't be compulsion to install, right? And at that point, it seemed to me, well, if the Australians think that, then perhaps we should reconsider the evidence of social compliance and decide. Sorry, I've almost run out of room, haven't I? Um, can I just say a couple more things? Um, I think another important point is that there needs to be oversight and safeguards here. There needs to be oversight of the entire um, progress of the app and its ramifications beyond the ethics advisory board, which is only advisory, and that's correct because we're not politically accountable, right? There needs to be something like the information commissioner but it needs to be wider than the information commissioner because it's wider than privacy it's about speech and movement and autonomy and due process and many issues and discrimination and therefore i proposed a coronavirus safeguarding commissioner and the last thing i'll say interestingly is that the joint human rights committee has proposed its own bill now in my mind although this is a very welcome development it's quite a limited bill probably due to the remit of the committee in which it deals primarily with privacy issues that are to some extent already dealt with by data protection. But it also does propose a new digital contact tracing human rights commissioner. And I think that's a good move. And I also note that the Lib Dems, uh, and we have a prominent Lib Dem here, of course, 
um, are also proposing their own bill. And I'm very pleased to see that it does the wider issues that um, I'm talking about, such as discrimination and coercion. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, Lillian. Uh, really interesting. And I think I just want to pick up the, the adoption of your ideas by the Joint Human Rights uh, Committee. I mean, where do you think they are deficient? Because some people would say that, of course, you, what you can't avoid is a practical obligation to have a smartphone, if you like, i.e. if, for instance, you are in a shopping mall and the private sector owners of the shopping mall say, uh, well, sorry, unless you can, you know, we can't have you in here sort of thing. Now, um, uh, unless you're pretty specific about the legislation, that's going to be quite difficult to avoid, isn't it? But I mean, that may be a side issue, but where, where were the Joint Human Rights Committee deficient in terms of not taking on board everything that you were suggesting? Well, I'll just pick up your first point, as it were, because I think that is a key point. And certainly one of the things that drove us in the original drafting towards a proportionality assessment rather than a blanket no compulsion was my knowledge as someone who's looked at workplace surveillance for a long time, that employers have considerable powers, really quite draconian powers, to require and to, to put in place surveillance of their workforce. And I think that whole area is going to need looked at. We're going to need balances. We probably are going to need proportionality and legitimacy assessments and impact assessments. So it's going to be difficult. It's going to be messy. But I think we do need not a private sector free for all on this because, and you know, no one will do this deliberately perhaps, but it could end up being a proxy smokescreen for bad treatment of vulnerable groups such as, for example, ethnic minority groups who might have more legitimate reasons, if misguided, for not wanting to download the app because they may be unreasonably afraid or reasonably afraid that it might affect, for example, their immigration status. And we've already heard some evidence like that. So that could become a proxy for driving these people out of the workforce. And I find that worrying. Okay? On the general point about the Joint Human Rights Committee, I may be wrong, but my impression is, having been a special advisor to one of these committees, that they can only draft within the competence of the evidence they heard, roughly speaking. And so I think that may have limited them in what they could do. It's a very good bill. It's very nicely drafted. But I would say, yeah, it doesn't have anything about compulsion. It doesn't have anything about need or not need to carry a smartphone at all points, to have it charged, to know how to use it, all these kind of points. Um, it says something, it has a requirement which goes further than DP, that consent is required to install the app. But it says nothing, which actually is in DP to some extent, about the quality of that consent um, or indeed about coercion to obtain that consent. So I think that's a rather limited kind of fig leaf like requirement, really, because consent is, as we know, almost meaningless in a great many con uh, contexts right now. Um, so these are some of the things I think it doesn't do. And obviously the elephant in the room is, are we going to get immunity passports? You know, when is that going to work? Should we look ahead to that when we don't know what the technology will form yet? My view, and this is absolutely for discussion, is that we should look ahead. We should roadmap ahead. We should undertake precautionary lawmaking at perhaps at quite a high level to deal with that because the entire purpose of immunity passports is going to be to discriminate. And we must make sure that it discriminates in a fair, legitimate, proportionate and transparent way. Thank you, Lillian. And uh, our panelists are very good at segueing into the next speaker, because that's a very good segue into Mark Findlay, who's the director of the Centre for Artificial Intelligence and Data Governance at Singapore Management University, and has been thinking about quite a lot of these things for some time, haven't you, Mark? Yes, thanks, Tim. Um, could I just say that one of the problems, I think, one of the major problems in the area of setting up uh, regulation uh, that works is that we're doing this on a state by state, region by region basis. So the UK is still talking about an app. There's been an app in China for the last five months. Uh, there's an app in Singapore, which has proved the exact point that uh, I'm surprised that most people who are still promoting apps haven't thought about. Firstly, it's a dead duck. It's highly unlikely that you'll get 60% even if you've got a very compliant society. Singapore is an extremely compliant society and they didn't get uh, that particular level of ascription. Uh, secondly, it just doesn't work. Uh, the Bluetooth problems in relation to what they can actually uh, link to are significant. Uh, 
um, Carly talked about trust. The government in almost every situation where they've tried to roll out these apps has not told the truth about uh, where the data is stored. If it's centralized, they don't have um, uh, conditions in place for when that data will be uh, destroyed, when it will disappear. Uh, if it's on the phone, then there's no guarantees, in fact, that the phone through other processes of Bluetooth would be secure. Um, so what happens is that you find the state moving into other forms of surveillance. And let's not fool ourselves, we live in a surveillance society largely anyway. This is just a surveillance society uh, on steroids at the present time. Uh, and so what you're finding, for example, in Singapore is a movement away from the tracing app to a thing called Safe Entry. Now, Safe Entry is a system whereby QR codes are scanned if you want to get into a supermarket or a hairdresser or a, uh, anywhere, a hospital, school, anywhere in Singapore. Now, the QR code sounds like it's a uh, you know, better idea, but the problem, all the problems that have been raised about discrimination, about the distress that's caused to the elderly who can't use this technology and find it extremely frustrating, the homeless um, in our city, the migrant laborers who are still using very antique forms of, of phone. Most of them in any case are under quarantine, so they wouldn't be going out in the first place. But there's massive discrimination associated with these sorts of surveillance technologies. I think, um, and, and there is one other point that I'd like to make. The second wave in Korea uh, came after uh, a number of individuals went out clubbing. Uh, and the reason why it's been almost impossible for the government to effectively trace uh, in a manual way or to encourage people to own up as to where it was that they were was that many of these clubs are LGBT. And in uh, Korea, it is a, a very serious discriminatory issue. And so a very large number of people who perhaps would have otherwise been willing to convey that information just won't, simply because it's fundamentally discriminating <coughs> in terms of their private lives and their sexuality. So I think that um, I'll just make two quick points because I know time is tight. One is I do not see a reason why, even in a surveillance society, that those who are proposing a new technology to surveil us, no matter how much they believe it's necessary to keep us safe, why they don't, at the same time they propose the technology, propose the regulatory safeguards. So don't leave it up to parliamentary committees, don't leave it up to parliament. And honestly, if you think that you're going to get a government to agree uh, to rolling out a compulsory app when they can't even get the majority of society to agree to stay at home, you can forget about that too. Uh, so I think what we really need to do is to say, the onus has to be put back on the private and public sector particularly where data is being shared, that if they want to roll out these, uh, these potentials and they believe that they are uh, good for us and that they believe that they are uh, going to keep us safe, don't tell us to trust them. Trust is really uh, in this, I think, a, a bit of a shimmer. What they've got to show us is what are the regulatory uh, protections in place. And these things aren't difficult. <coughs> I mean, simply, for example, excuse me, for example, a, um, a, you know, a dead data clause, a sunset clause would be something that would certainly help the trust that a lot of people would have. I'm perfectly happy, for example, to go the extra mile with surveillance while the uh, virus is at hand. Uh, but I need to know what's going to happen uh, post virus and ongoing. Um, and my final point on this, which I think is important, and it does link into the discussion about, um, about passports is the idea that we create regulatory frameworks that in fact are inherently ongoing in their discriminatory capacity. I think it's very important that we need to consider and to publicly debate whether in fact, firstly, the technology will achieve what it says it will, and the tracing apps certainly look like they're not going to. Uh, secondly, if we're going to have safe entry QR codes, if that's a good idea and it's, it's going to work, then can you tell us something about what happens to the data when I go to the supermarket, when I go to the hospital, or when I go uh, to wherever it is I choose to use the QR app? So just openness is what we want, a bit of openness, transparency, and a bit of civil society engagement before 
we're simply told that this is the best thing for us. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. I want to come later to the question, because I'm going to put that to the whole panel, as to whether it's possible, uh, in the view of the panel, to develop some kind of international blueprint um, which could actually deal with some of the issues uh, in terms of the, the regulatory framework, the protections, sunset clause and so on that one might think appropriate to put in place to make sure one gets that public trust on board. Um, but I want to explore the, the, the nuances of that in, in international terms and, and to see whether or not there are kind of cultural norms that one might have to get across and so on. But what I wanted to ask you in particular was that you've obviously talked about the Singapore experience, which has interested quite a lot of us, particularly that very low take up point. And of course, they switched the nature of the app after a time as well, and so on and so forth. I mean, are, uh, you know, we always, uh, at the moment, the, the, there's a very strong tendency to say, well, they all got it, they got it right in uh, uh, Singapore, they got it right in um, uh, South Korea, and so on and so forth. I mean, have, are they learning those sorts of lessons that you've talked to us about um, uh, for the future? Or... Um, are they uh, in the same sort of position as many politicians are in a sort of state of denial? Um, you know, they're on the defensive. They don't want to be seen to be uh, vulnerable to criticism. Well, Singapore was the, um, the pin-up boy, really, of uh, the world when it came to control in the early days. And that wasn't because of any app. It was because of two very simple things which they've continued with. One is a massive amount of tracing and that's manual tracing, and the other is a massive amount of testing. Now, the testing that goes on here, 30 to 40,000 people are tested every day. Um, but it's interesting, when you look at a place like Singapore, which is considered to be the smart city of the world, it was pretty unsmart when it came to the infection of migrant workers in workers' hostels. And now this is a perfect example of where the government, because it had a blind spot, simply forgot or ignored the fact that you have a massive number of young men uh, warehoused in conditions where they, uh, the concept of safe distancing is ridiculous. So in Singapore, we have 28,000 cases now of which amongst Singaporeans and permanent residents, it would be about six or 700. And so the rest are all migrant workers. So Singapore certainly did get it right. Uh, except for the fact that they turned a blind eye to this vulnerable population. Uh, they're now uh, working like uh, wildfire to try and to, to, to uh, fix that problem. And, and I commend their efforts for doing that. But it is often the political way that we tend to ignore people in aged care institutions. We ignore people at home, old people who need social connection for uh, their, their livelihood, for their survival. We just simply assume, and also, that everyone can socially distance. I mean, it's interesting when we talk about privacy, for example, 70% of the world doesn't have the luxury of a privacy right or even privacy context. So I think we've got to think about this perhaps not just within our own little uh, microcosm, but to look regionally, internationally, and particularly look at the South world, because that's where the real continuation of this virus is going to be. Mark, thank you very much indeed. And now over to Professor uh, Peter Fussy, um, uh, 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 who is um, uh, a professor in the Department of Sociology at Essex University. And many people remember his groundbreaking uh, report um, uh, uh, on the use of live facial recognition technology by the Metropolitan um, Police. And it'll be very interesting to see if there are um, any parallels, Pete? Oh, thank you for such a, a kind introduction too. And, and to the other panellists, it's quite, you know, it's always difficult to follow or be last on a quality panel. Not just the people who say what some of the things you wanted to say, but they'll also say them in a far more elegant way than I could. So um, I'll try my best. I'm not a lawyer either. I'm a social scientist, as, as um, Tim's introduction stated, so I might come at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, I think one of the things that's emerged from the conversation so far is... You know, that this kind of notion that te it's technology versus, you know, or it's privacy versus health or something like that is, is an insufficient way uh, of, feeling, uh, of looking at the issue, that technology isn't, isn't the answer without all the other infrastructure surrounding it. 
and actually you know poor performing technology can be you know often worse than no technology at all so what I wanted to say were five things uh, very very quickly and some of those I think there are parallels with the way in which we've dealt with other forms of quite invasive surveillance technology in public as well and the first is about trialing um, we're at a critical moment now where we're shifting from a trial phase to, to widespread deployment, yet there's not a lot of clarity on what the trial methodology was, what are the material conditions necessary for the success um, of this piece of technology. And I think that links into a wider problem about how we trial technology on in or on the public there's a lack of standardization about it and certainly research myself and colleagues have done in other contexts you often see that a trial is a way of really the questions are how can we convince the public that this is a good thing rather than looking at you know the sort of the the wider and less convenient outcomes when we think of success i think as carly um i will all panelists carly in particular and also mark have pointed out there's, you know, there are real sort of issues that extend beyond technical performance um, that any proper evaluation has to capture a range of implications. Um, and, and often these are social and, as I would say, sociological. I think just reflecting on, on what people have said before me, you know, it's quite interesting when we think about this 60% success rate. We have a, you know, it's framed in a very utilitarian way. Um, and the use of this technology and, and, and the population is seen in a very sort of broad sense you know with other work that's been done not only by ourselves but other people on the chilling effects of surveillance you know places the populations that have the least trust in state organizations state authorities are probably those that are the most vulnerable as well for a lot of reasons we can get into in in, in questioning so i think we need to think about the uneven impacts across different different groups um, you know, and, and then there's a whole range of other issues there as well about, you know, kind of urban populations, more densely populated areas, false handshakes of Bluetooth and where healthcare, where public services have been underfunded and all of these sorts of ways in which uh, disadvantage is, is kind of compounded and reproduced and reinforced. Um, and then, yes, there's other questions of whether the non-technical infrastructure is there to support the app. You know, Lillian talked about testing and, and so on, which, you know, you don't need me to really restate. Um, so where does that leave us? Well, I think one of the things that, you know, and it's again, this is a point that Lillian raised, I think, we, where we could do some creative thinking is around the proper sort of prior impact assessment before we use any of this technology. You know, that's certainly something I've felt with other forms of technology, facial recognition, et cetera, as well, you know, that data protection is not, does you know, data protection is a, is a good starting point, but it doesn't cover the range of, of harms, particularly of something of this scale and level of intrusion and when the stakes are so critical and so high. So to think more broadly beyond uh, data protection and also, you know, not only the implications beyond data protection, privacy, article eight sorts of issues, we see a lot with data protection impact assessments, a very gestural approach towards compliance. And we saw that with the Isle of Wight uh, testing and the way in which, you know, explicitly stated that there wouldn't be systematic surveillance of the population, which of course, there is, because that's how the app works, you know, or, or issues about tracking that were denied and then you get into the text of it. So, you know, sometimes that might be intentional, but often I suspect it's the use of the boilerplate responses to impact assessments, and it's a very gestural way. Uh, and, you know, that, that massively impacts on issues of trust, which Carly has talked about. So we need, you know, proper human rights assessments um, that, that address the range of issues and are scrutinised and scrutable. Um, so how do we gain, gain that transparency and trust um, as well? So there's lots of questions about purpose limitation, which I think people have already talked about, um, you know, the, the way in which the downstream functionality of these apps is, is not necessarily clear. There are, of course, other indirect um, issues there as well, such as vendor lock-in. I think it'd be really interesting to start to probe the public-private partnership relationships, not really my area of expertise, but it's, it's a really important issue about governance and, and long-term impact. Um, and then the final thing I'll say um, before finishing is, is to think about oversight in a more robust sense, which I think the issue of oversight connects a lot of these points together. 
Um, you know, so I've, I've already mentioned that a lot of oversight is kind of, you know, is at the front end of the process almost like, you know, so I can't comment on, you know, ethics panels. I'm on several policing ethics panels and I can see how good intentions get fed through, but they're really at the authorization stage, not at the long term kind of assessment of how something's being used. So you need, you know, continued, continued review and post hoc review of how, how something works. And, you know, just to finish off, I wanted just to link back to a discussion that was made about the, um, the JCHR, the Joint Committee on Human Rights uh, draft bill, which I, I agree, I think it's, it, it's really, you know, it's fantastic such a thing exists and it's a really positive development, yet there are limitations as well. I mean, I would say this as, as a non-lawyer, as a social scientist, but something that really struck me was on the section on oversight um, and regulation, and it's probably a question for the other panellists, seems to me that it's very specific as well. So on one hand, the, the technology has all this capability for different functionality to be repurposed in the future and so on. Yet the regulatory body is very, very narrowly defined. It is a digital contact tracing human rights commissioner. So when we start to move on to, you know, as other panelists said, immunity certification or something else, where does that remit end? So how broadly should we conceive the role of a regulator? And as I think a good parallel with that is the role of the biometrics commissioner currently that we have, who's not really a regulator, uh, but his role, it's currently a he, is, is defined in statute as, you know, very explicitly around DNA and fingerprints. So you you know, he, there's not that adaptability in the role in the remit to cover sort of the wider, wider harms and concerns as they develop. But yeah, that's generally my, my sort of opening thoughts. Pete, thank you so much. And it, you've touched on exactly the point that I wanted to come back to you on, because um, when you talked about, you know, trialing technology and so on, you, you were very much focusing and, and um, clearly deliberately um, more on standards than on uh, legislation and so on and what you really are pointing up um, is that uh, legislation can take you so far and of course you may not draw it widely enough and we can have that debate in a minute but are you a, a believer in in standards actually uh, before you even get to uh, the point of regulation or legislation yeah, that's a very interesting question. And sadly, I haven't thought it through as, <laughs> as much as I think you're crediting me for. But um, yeah, certainly, I think, you know, there's a danger with surveillance technologies. And we've seen this over the last 25 years with, with particularly with overt surveillance like CCTV and other forms of video surveillance, where the debate gets restricted down to issues of standards. Um, and the standards is something you can measure, right? You can, you know, they're easily quantifiable in, in a lot of ways, which... So I think, you know, there's definitely absolutely a role for standards because then that feeds into questions of utility, which then allows you to have, you know, all your proportionality and, you know, higher level necessity discussions. So I think standards definitely have a role, but it has to be heavily caveated, um, that, you know, that, that they aren't the sum total uh, of what's needed for author and the authorization of technology. But yeah, I mean, I think certainly when I was thinking about standards, I was really thinking about standards for for testing where you know that if you take a scientific approach towards testing or evaluation you know, if you're looking at whether something works or not then there's an option there not to use something because it doesn't work you know i've not seen that logic reproduced in public trials of of invasive technology great thank you very much pete um well um i'm going to come back to the full council so to speak um, and and raise the issue about this uh, blueprint, uh, you know, whether uh, we can sort of um, develop some sort of uh, global type blueprint, you know, like, for instance, the OECD principles on AI or, um, you know, some of the other uh, uh, g more global um, uh, sets of uh, uh, of principles, human rights and so on and so forth. I mean, do you think, um, Carly, that... Uh, uh, it is amenable to that kind of, of international um, approach. I mean, is there not quite a one size fits all, but certainly a kind of a checklist that you think uh, would be uh, useful in those circumstances, which would include, you know, some of the um, issues, public, private uh, oversight type issues, but obviously they'd have to be tailored uh, for individual country circumstances. Yeah, I think that there's real value in pursuing a um, an approach which takes us beyond national borders, given the 
tie between COVID related technology and contact tracing and the potential for it to be used to open up not only economic movement within borders, but outside of borders as well. So there's, there's this big question about what will it take for us to travel again? And of course, where we're going to see um, those advancing the use of technology to enable that. And that's where we get very quickly to interoperability and the need for us to have kind of cross-border approaches. So I think from, from a very pragmatic perspective, a, a supranational approach to standardization could be quite an important in, able to, in order to enable travel and therefore economies to open up. So at the European level, the, um, there are a number of initiatives already trying to prescribe standards, um, in particular technical standards. So the, the um, European Commission, I think DG Connect has published a set of standards around contact tracing and there's also an e-health working group at the commission level that's talking about standards for interoperability in a technical sense and I think um, a pedna to that is some minimum requirements around legislative or legal safeguards as well. Um, and I think that this is probably a, uh, an example of when the UK should be trying to standardise with its European neighbours on these things, both technically but also in terms of protections. I think the, the two other points just on, on a legislative approach. One is the importance of enforcement. I think that um, everybody on the call will understand that. Um, and, and I think enforcement obviously has to devolve to a national um, level issue. So there's kind of less scope there, I think, at a regional approach. But secondly is to, I think both Lillian and, and Pete made this point, which is around um, future proofing the legislative approach and how do you do it in a way that both speaks to the particular demands of the technologies that are being proposed in the context of the pandemic, while also making them slightly more technologically neutral, perhaps, than the Joint Committee on Human Rights Bill, in which is very specific to the current iteration of digital contact tracing apps and might not enable um, future technologies. So Lillian pointed out immunity passports. We understand from some leaked documents that were published in Wired last week that there is contemplation of expanding the functionality of the contact tracing app to bring in some type of health status, potentially immunity status, and kind of expand that app. Um, so, you know, the, the legislation proposed doesn't feel like it can, you know, uh, really fit very well to all future uses of that. You know, there's certainly ways to design technologically neutral or future-proof legislation, and we, you know, that's often through the use of commissioners or codes of practice or kind of delegated authority. And I think thinking through some of those things would be really important to, to future proof the, the law. I, I'm going to come to Lillian in a minute to comment on some of that, but also to pick up this kind of public private issue as to where that sort of regulation should be applicable. But I want to come to Mark because, you know, in a sense, you're um, based internationally, Mark, and um, are there sort of cultural questions here. I mean, you know, we all know about GDPR, um, that actually in, there are many countries, particularly um, Eastern, um, uh, uh, East Asian jurisdictions, South Asian jurisdictions that really um, uh, have not or would not subscribe to uh, the overarching GDPR philosophy, if you like. I mean, would that be a barrier to the adoption of this kind of approach? Well, it certainly would if we talk about human rights, because unfortunately, and I don't like saying this, but if you talk about rights of privacy as a human right in China, you're wasting your time. And it, large parts of, of Southeast Asia and Southern Asia are the same, which doesn't mean that we should just simply ignore the debate, because people should have, whether you're in the South world or the North world, the right to have their um, human dignity protected. But I think that it's a careful issue about the way in which we term the things we're trying to, to, to achieve. Data integrity, for example, which is very much connected to privacy as I see it, is a big issue in China, big issue in Singapore, big issue in, in, um, uh, in India, not so much because uh, we attach it to rights, but rather we attach it to uh, data validity. And so it's got a much more mechanical uh, process to it. But I think we can craft something that has a human dignity consequence, it just might need to be worded in a slightly different way. Could I just make one quick point? Uh, I mean, I get surprised by this discussion when it, when it is uh, put around the, the COVID crisis specifically. 
when in fact um, Google and other great platform players are up to their necks in this process in terms of sharing data and uh, rolling out possible platforms and technology. And they don't have a jurisdiction. They don't live anywhere. They're, or, or, they're international anyway. Uh, and they, like it or not, have been spruiking ethics for a very long time. Now, I think that there are two ethical principles here that we could focus down on, even if we could get no agreement about anything else. And one is transparency. If people simply knew what it was that was happening with their data, it would put them in a much better position to be able to do something about it. You wouldn't be using Uber or um, Deliveroo if you realised that secondary data from your uh, commercial transaction was being sold by the platform operator. Uh, now, the final thing I would say is connected to transparency. There's no point in transparency unless you tie it to accountability. And so there's got to be some framework and this might necessarily mean that we agree with the principle and then we locate the mechanism in the jurisdiction that best suits us, whether it's a commissioner or a, uh, an ombudsperson or whatever. But I think those two issues are of themselves enough to focus an international approach. Thank you, Mark. And I'm going to come back in a minute to Pete to talk, uh, to tease out some of that sort of understanding, those skills and understanding issues, actually, uh, which I think are uh, important because there's no point in uh, uh, having standards or legislation unless there's a context in which you can uh, uh, validly persuade people that this is, this is the right thing that you're, that you're doing, basically. Um, and you're quite right. Uh, Mark, you know, that you can't legislate for everything and therefore, um, in a sense, it, you, we need to have a set of norms that, that people share. But um, I'm going to come back to Pete on that um, from his uh, sociologist um, point of view. But Lillian, um, the validity of certain types of legislation, you know, how far should we be going in terms of uh, regulating not just the public sector, but the private sector use of uh, of the, this kind of app and so on. I mean, obviously, we're broadening out the conversation, not purely about the COVID-19 apps, but um, uh, because in a sense, but they have highlighted some of the issues. Uh, unmute. Sorry, the sun came out here and I couldn't see. Um, sorry, annoyingly, I'd just like briefly to go back to some of the very, very good points Mark was making and indeed you were making before about, about the international approach to this, because I think drawing on the experience we've had with AI ethics over the last two, three years is really salutary and in a, a bad way, not a good way, I'm afraid, because what we've largely seen has been a multiplicity of codes of AI ethics from almost everybody, every international association, every private partnership, partnership for AI, from every center that's been set up. And overall, and this is a very Western centric, uh, you know, developed world focus, but overall the effect has been to say, hey, we already have law, but let's push that out of the way and let's have ethics instead, which are actually not binding because that will make life a lot easier for the private sector and for some nation states. And this now has a name, which is ethic washing. Um, and what we do not want to see is COVID washing, I think. This is why I'm very fond of the coercive power of actual national law. Now that does not mean, obviously, that we don't need a development of international norms. And a better example, I think, is to go right back to the OECD principles on privacy back in 1981, which had an enormous effect in, in coalescing views on privacy protection and led to modern data protection laws in most countries, though not the US. Um, but the other couple of points that are kind of elephants in the room about this, I mean, we haven't really spoken much because we're not doing technical on the Google Apple um, involvement. Now, it's very true, and I think this has been hinted at by various people, that the effective international norm has been imposed by Google and Apple. And in this case, it happens to be one that I like because I'm a data protection lawyer and it imposes data minimization, it imposes collecting the least necessary data. But there is this huge elephant in the room that this time they use their power for good. And what happens next time when they use their power for evil? Now, I don't have an answer to that one, but I, I absolutely take Mark's point that what we need is far, far, far more transparency and hopefully some oversight over what these people are doing in future because it's going to affect all our lives. But the kind of last point I'd make on that maybe, and then maybe come back to what you actually asked me if you want to, um, is the get out of jail free card right now is anonymization. 
right? When, when people say, we don't share your data with anybody, we don't give it to our private partners. And that's what the NHS is saying right now as well, if you look at their statements. Um, what they mean is we anonymize it and then we give it to other people. And at the moment, it's very, very well known beyond argument that if you have big data that is anonymized and you connect it to other data sets, then re-identification is trivial. Um, and we have to address this. It is, it is the elephant in the room under the bed, if you like to go back to my horrible metaphor. So do, do you want me to go back to the question you're actually asking me, Tim, or if I used up all my time? Please. No, carry on. Oh, about the, so about, should we coerce the private sector as well as the public sector? Well, as I said before, I think that was difficult and it depends on your politics, you know? I mean, we've lived up till now, we're very largely in the West for some while, at least in this country, America, in a neoliberal market, less if our economy, where we've said, let leave the private sector to get on with it to a large extent. Where we've now gone through is a sort of short but intense period of essentially socialism or communism, you know, in which the, the, the government's been paying for what 80% of the wages in the country or something. The question is now, as we come out of that period, what do we think um, in the interest of what is a common good, which is not being subjected to repeated spikes of the infection going forward what kind of controls do we want to put on the market so i would say yes we do need to have coercion of the private sector in this area as well as the public sector otherwise there's no point <laughs> great thank you and 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 pete i mean um, it's it, can we operate in this kind of um situation where in a sense i mean if i was being cynical i would say that uh, governments take advantage of the fact that people don't really understand um, what is happening to them. And, uh, you know, how, how can we um, sort of get through that so we actually have a much more informed uh, group of people so that when we um, suggest legislation, people can really understand, or standards, if you like, people can really understand the need for it. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, some of my answers will echo things that have just uh, been said earlier, but I think, you know, the the having some kind of pro, robust and trustworthy oversight in place is, is key to that, that holds people to, to account. We have, I would say, an appalling record in this country of surveillance oversight, of having meaningful oversight over public surveillance. And I could talk at a very great length about why I feel that way. But the, you know, no, that's the first thing to sort of bring into it. And also, it's, you know, if we're thinking about building trust so that people will use this app for instance and that it will work you know there are people that will probably just download the app and use it anyway people that you know need to be persuaded are those people who are probably more vulnerable and have experience you know over policing and things like that or generally have you know more vulnerable socioeconomic groups so it just shows that you you know the kind of current messaging around all of this and the opacity in which decisions are being made is really really problematic and is not going to do anything to to address that so, right, so I've done the academic thing of moaning about things and saying why things are bad. In terms of moving forward, you know, we need a, a clear understanding of the differences, as Mark said, between transparency and accountability. There's lots you can do to try and build public trust. You can publish, you know, decisions that have been made. You don't have to give proprietary secrets away, but there's lots of information you can give, give the public. There are lots of safeguards. And having proper regulation and proper oversight and regulation bodies that have have real power of censure and ensuring it's really easy to access points of remedy i would say and you know back to carly's point about delegated authority which i think is a really important one having a body that is flexible enough to understand the implications of how things are in these kind of more vulnerable parts of society and you know there's according to the ons there's you know about five and a half million adults in this country who don't use the internet um, you know, the digital divide maps, I would suggest, I mean, I don't know, but I would bet a lot of money on it, that the digital divide in terms of exclusion from, from smart technology maps on quite closely to those who are most vulnerable from COVID-19. You know, particularly well, the elderly, for instance, those over 70, at least like to have smartphones, all these sorts of things. So having, building trust in those areas rather than a blanket sort of approach is, is absolutely crucial. Great, thank you. Now, um, 
uh, uh, of course, everybody's talked about oversight and many of our questioners, um, many of our attendees uh, have, have, have raised this issue as well. I mean, it's all very well. We've talked at large about the need for oversight and so on. But I mean, what kind of oversight, especially in UK terms, Carly, would be fit for purpose? I mean, you know, Pete's uh, uh, given pretty big agenda. I mean, they've got to be pure as the driven snow and um, everything else, uh, this, uh, this uh, new regulator. Um, where would you put this without, I mean, you know, we've had um, a number of different proposals uh, in the AI field and in other fields from people like, you know, Dot Everyone and so on for a particular kinds of regulator. Do we need to reinvent uh, the wheel? Do we need to add another regulator? give the job to somebody, uh, exi some existing regulator? Where, where do you see all this sort of fitting together in order to get what all four of you have uh, mm. talked about in terms of effective oversight? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, the first thing I would say is that I think we need um, not all, uh, the focus shouldn't entirely be on post hoc at, um, oversight, but we do need more processes with a great, greater um, number and diversity of viewpoints being fed into the development of technology, particularly in the public sector. And so one of the recommendations in the Ada Lovelace Institute report, Exit Through the App Store, was that the government establish a group of advisors on technology and emergencies, um, much the same way we have the scientific advisory group of experts, SAGE, we recommended um, GATE group of advisors on technology and emergencies that would be able to advise on the process of technology development, establish the thresholds and tests by which, uh, against which the tech should be measured prior to rollout and then monitor uh, its implementation. Um, and that would, that, that would be a, uh, that should be a group that had a range of different disciplinary expertise. Um, uh, I think that some of the steps that NHSX and government have taken, including establishing the Ethics Advisory Board, have gone some way to addressing those concerns about feeding in a range of uh, viewpoints during the development prior to rollout. But I don't think there's, there's no necessary, sorry, there's not the kind of requisite gatekeeping authority that a body should have in order to sign off something before it gets rolled out. And I think that that would be an important um, characteristic of any uh, um, kind of advisory body in that respect. In terms of post hoc um, oversight, I think the, there's a lot to be said um, for how well the, the ICO does in performing its oversight functions. Um, and much of that is around, uh, is due to its, its very genuine efforts to balance a range of competing concerns across private public sector and to take a very um, kind of pragmatic advisory role in trying to um, change practice without having to get to a point where it's about enforcement and restrictions. I think the ICO is, is massively overstretched and I don't think we can keep putting everything in the data and technology space on the ICO's shoulders because as somebody said in a recent webinar, you know, they can't be the regulator for everything and yet data and technology are everywhere across the sector now. So we, we actually really need to think about how we can take some of the really positive things of the ICO's model and, um, and skill it up across different uh, domains and sectors. And I'm not really sure personally where I stand on whether that should be a super regulator or whether we should just equip the various existing regulators and others with the same types of skills and expertise that exist within the ICO. I suspect that the latter is more appropriate, particularly given the need for sector specific approaches to uh, law and ethics around technology. I think one of the, you know, Lillian spoke, um, uh, you know, her points were, were really on the mark about how problematic the AI ethics space has become in recent years um, as a way to, from, of diverting attention from regulation and, and practice. But um, I think one of the lessons from that is we're not going to get anywhere with high level principles that seek to address every possible application of technology in public and private sector. We actually really need to talk about the details, we need to talk about the sectors, and we need to talk about the applications and the use cases. And so the regulatory landscape should respond to that. And I think building up expertise within the existing regulators and establishing some new ones where necessary is probably the better path than trying to imagine a kind of super regulator that would do everything everywhere. And you're a, you're a sandboxing fan, clearly. 
uh, uh, even sure. though you think yeah. the ICO is overburdened. So pragmatically, you like the idea of testing and, and trying out things in a, in a safe way, but under the eye of the regulator. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure there are critiques in Major Sandboxing. I'm not across the, the issue at all, but I do think that there's something about um, enabling kind of mistakes we made and those to be addressed and fixed before we have, you know, I, I, I guess I take real umbrage at this idea that the public should be the test subjects for a new technology, that you would roll out a technology everywhere in beta, you know, in beta phase. I think that that's not the way we should be doing technology deployment, particularly when the stakes are so high and whether there can be negative impacts as, as Pete pointed out, that, there can, that, that this tech could actually do more harm than good. I think we need to find a way to test and iterate before we give it to everybody essentially and then work out the, the problems at that point. Great, um, I'm gonna to come to Mark and Lillian in a minute, but I wanted just to test out this, your gate um, thoughts on, on Pete, because in a sense, um, uh, you know, we've had this, um, whether it's tradition, I don't know, but we do have this faith in scientists, I think, to a much greater degree than we do in politicians. So, you know, um, uh, the sight of two scientists appearing with um, a cabinet minister, you know, has been kind of like a human shield um, uh, for the government for a fair bit uh, during this whole sort of COVID uh, crisis, Pete. But um, do you think that uh, the equivalent of, of SAGE and that suggested by Carly and Ada Lovelace uh, is, is, a, is a good way of, in a sense, predicating, uh, uh, getting trust, public trust in this whole area on which then you can build other things, you know, regulation, enforcement and so on and so forth? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's almost like scientific expertise and um, lends politics credibility, isn't it? <laughs> but um, the yeah, I think it's a really good question. You know, where does expertise lie and how can you access it and, and use it? I do think, um, you know, <clears throat> there's, you know, that you, you can have sort of bodies such as SAGE, for instance, or, or other bodies. I kind of like the idea that the investigatory powers commissioner's office sort of approach. They have um, what they call a technology advisory panel. So they'll have a panel that's chaired by by somebody. In in this case, it's a it's a former Home Office chief scientific advisor. But you can have a more fluid membership, which will allow you um, access to to information on a more ad hoc basis, which is often when it's required in these in these matters when an issue emerges and so on. So, I think you know you absolutely have to look outside of of, of politics, but also outside of particular disciplines. You know. As, Speaking as an academic, I, I'm fully aware how territorial it is, um, and so having having access to a broad range of of expertise, which has a more fluid membership and more dynamic membership, would be a really useful way to approach it. I think. So, Mark, just looking internationally, I mean, do you think uh, we're barking up the right tree? I mean, obviously there are going to be issues in terms of how actively even a set of uh, global norms are enforced because, um, you know, as you talked earlier, um, there is a very different attitude towards data privacy um, in the Far East. But can we get halfway there in terms of um, uh, the kinds of enforcement that would be appropriate um, uh, in non-European uh, jurisdictions, for instance? Yeah, I think we can. I mean, I think what we have to do is to work out, first of all, what technologies will tolerate because they work. And too much of this discussion, uh, certainly in Western Europe, is about tracing apps, which have largely been shown to be very problematic. And part of the reason there's a lot of discussion about uh, uh, tracing apps is because the governments that are promoting them are not doing mass testing, and they're very keen to get everyone out from uh, quarantine at home and, and, and back to work. So they want everyone to have an app in their phone and feel very secure. I think what we need to do is once we've identified those technologies that are working, some of them like safe entry technologies, and then we say to ourselves, okay, back to the point I made a little bit earlier, responsibility rests with the promoter of that technology, the promoter of that invasive surveillance, to have some protections in place. And those protections could in fact be quite simply back to broad principles, but broad principles that are directed at the right people. 
I'll just finish very quickly on this because time is tight. I agree with what Lillian and what Carly have said about the problem with broad principles and ethics as a top-down exercise. But we've just published a paper on our website, which is the result of a lot of work that we've been doing with frontline uh, AI developers and designers, the millennials that make these things work, to try and work out whether in fact they understand ethics and whether they would design a surveillance technology that was ethical. And the interesting thing that came out of the research, which you might want to reflect on, is the majority of them said that there were two principles they were concerned about. One is that it should be fair, and secondly, it shouldn't hurt people. Now, it doesn't matter where in the world you go, people understand fairness, and they understand whether you get hurt or you don't. Uh, and I think that there are ways of approaching uh, the ecosystem that is responsible for developing these technologies, not just the boardroom, not just the managers, uh, but a lot of the developers and designers and say, look, can we get principal design in place? And then also, how, how can we back that up with some external regulatory diligence? Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to come on to Lillian because you may just want to comment on uh, what Carly was talking about very early on uh, when she last spoke about um, uh, the impact of ethics advisory boards. Um, on the other hand, uh, you may want to focus on the efficacy of uh, uh, oversight and where you uh, would place the duty to uh, uh, make sure that whatever legislation we had or the standards we developed were actually implemented and, and complied with. Yeah, yeah, that's, oh, I am off mute, right. Um, that was all very interesting from Carly and from Mark, actually. In some ways, I'd like to mix up a response to, to both of the, the points that you've just raised, uh, Tim, and, and what they said. Um, First of all, I think I'm, you, don't have, you don't have to answer my questions, Lillian. <laughs> I am going to answer it, sort of. It's really interesting. It's making me think. Um, first of all, I think I am allowed to say, as a member of the Ethics Advisory Board, that I was told very clearly and very helpfully that we are an advisory board. We advise. We are not able to make decisions. We do not sign off. We do not say you are not allowed to go forward with this technology or even this technology in this form. We give ethical advice that we think these parts won't work, are not ethical, are not legal, etc. Um, and that's because we are not politicians and therefore we're not politically accountable uh, and also we're not vetted for certain aspects of national security. So whenever you're talking about a really national political issue like this, in this case, during a pandemic emergency, um, it's very difficult to say that the Ethics Advisory Board can be, I think, was said, be, be the kind of stop-go mechanism that's sort of in the air here. And that's even before you get to the the real politic. I mean, what we've seen, this is going to be a worked example in management, whatever public sector textbooks for centuries, I think. Um, but when you're in an emergency, people go ahead fairly quickly with what they think will be useful given limited knowledge, bounded rationality, et cetera, in a moment of emergency. And the problem is at what point as more information comes in, can you turn it round? I mean, the, the, the kind of analogy I've been using is like the Titanic, you know, one of these huge container ships where you have to start turning at four days before you want to turn it. And I think we're seeing that a bit because, as people have said correctly, NHSX started building their app, their centralised app, at least a week before the idea of a decentralised app even sort of hove on the horizon. And to me, one of the issues has been at what point do we have the ability and the time and the expertise to turn things around and change our mind? and uh, this is me not speaking as an EAB person, it's purely personal. I think one of the problems in this country is that it's become impossible to change your mind and that politically you are not allowed to say I got it wrong or I didn't have the expertise, I didn't have the information and now we have to change our minds. And that's why to some extent we're seeing this use of scientific advisors as human shields, I think, because if they do have to change their mind, they're going to say, oh, it's the science, which is another of my pet hates, because there is no the science. There is only scientific opinions, many of which are contradicting and partial in yes. different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So the, the other thing I'd kind of say about ethics and about, I, I absolutely take Mark's um, expertise here. I'm not an ethicist, I'm a lawyer, um, but, I have been saying a long time and during the AI debate, long time before COVID-19 unfortunately arrived, that there is a very big difference here between the reality of the private sector and what we used to in say the medical sector. In the medical sector, if something's unethical, then it will be stopped. 
because people will lose their reputation, they will be struck off, doctors will be struck off, hospitals will be sued, or there will be huge loss of reputational capital. If somebody is asked to do something unethical within the private sector, notably the software sector in Silicon Valley, then the question will be, do I lose my job if I say no? And will the business take it seriously? And will the business try to suppress it? Because the business is in the business of trying to make money. And we've seen that repeatedly with Google and maybe not Apple, but with many of the Silicon Valley players over the last few weeks. So until we have complete kind of whistleblower protection, conscience immunity, um, professional guild ethics for everyone in the IT industry, I cannot see how that kind of idea of high level ethical constraint, however well felt by millennials, can really help us because they don't have the power to put those kind of ethical constraints into action. And I'm sorry, I'm saying this in a very annoying out there way. I'd say it less so in an academic context, but I think it is an important point to make and I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much, Lillian. Now, I want to come on just in the last um, few minutes to the real nitty gritty uh, in terms of uh, things like audit, impact assessment. Um, uh, we talked already about sandboxing, but um, should we be getting much more um, specific and able uh, in our judgments to assess some of these things? It isn't just, as Mark points out, you know, frankly, we shouldn't get over obsessed with the COVID-19 apps. This, is, this has some general application um, but of course, we are just more sensitised to it, rather like the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where you know we all sort of sat up uh, more uh, than we otherwise would have done because of a particular um, set of circumstances. So, I mean, the question is, do we have enough tools, really? I mean, some of us have read the data um, protection impact assessment that was done uh, for the Isle of Wight app, and not all of us were impressed by the quality of it, for instance. Um, and there've been you know, a fair bit of commentary on that. But I mean, do we yet um, uh, really know what we're letting ourselves in for, um, whether as politicians, regulators, or even developers? Mark? Yes, very quickly. I think it goes back to one of the points that I made very early, Tim, and that is the, the need to look over the fence. Um, if we're going to evaluate whether, in fact, these new technologies are worth tolerating because they make us safer, then we've got to firstly establish that. That's the first evaluation. Do they work? Are they, in fact, protecting us? And therefore, on the basis of that, are we willing to give up certain liberties? And then we need protection uh, in relation to enforcement and to oversight. I, I just think that a lot of this is a genuine distraction because we know very clearly from the experience of those countries where the virus has been contained that the two principal strategies that work are mass testing and tracing in a physical sense. Now, other things to aid to that, I'm all for them. If you can prove that they work. If they can't, then there's no point in even talking about overseeing them because we don't need them. That's really interesting. I mean, in a sense, you would uh, concur with quite a lot of those kind of AI uh, uh, narrative uh, researchers who, in a sense, say, well, what we often do is put our anxieties uh, onto the technology, uh, whereas actually, uh, you know, this is, a, this is an issue which, where the, the app is a very small component part of the whole thing. And the and actual one of the reasons is I going to be done by, by humans. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it's become such a focus for debate. Because the politicians like to talk about it. Because it's something which is divisive, but it's not necessarily something which really requires them to prove that it's going to function. I mean, I think the biggest thing for us to remember in all of this is that we have a crisis which requires control. Some of those surveillance strategies that are put in place will help us, some won't. It's one of the reasons, for example, why IBM and a number of the big tech companies have moved away from facial recognition. Not because they have big hearts, but because facial recognition just in so many instances doesn't work. So if the app doesn't work, then let's talk about other things that might. Great. It's still been a great conversation for an hour and a half though. Uh, Lillian, would you like to 
um, uh, just unpack this a bit. I mean, do you sometimes feel as a disjunct between some of the your you know your knowledge as a lawyer in terms of the regulatory and legal framework and some of the getting to grips with the you know the detail of the assessment and the audit and so on? Yeah, I, I, I'm really struck with how much I don't have the answers here. Yeah. I'm very taken. I have, I've said the same things with less expertise as Mark. You know, this thing won't work. Why are we spending so much time on it? And I note, I was going to put on chat, but I don't know how, the British Medical Journal, who are the leading medical journal in the country, have just really come out saying, you know, that all these things are shiny distractions and why aren't we just getting with the manual tracing and the testing? You know, so I, this is generic among top level experts. But I go back to my point about how do you do a U turn? Because even by the time I'd become involved in this sort of about three weeks ago, and certainly by the time NHSX has started working on their app, they didn't really know the way things were going to go. So there's been a process of knowledge acquisition. I do also take the point that there are underlying political discourses, just as there were with the AI ethics, where there was a clear kind of urge to get away from hard legal regulation towards soft self-regulation, right? So we have to be looking out for these things. But yeah, the balance between top level principles and low level detail is a tough one. But my experience as a boring private lawyer is that people take shelter in high level principles because the devil is in the detail. That's the phrase I keep using. So perhaps someone who you know, also knows about detail could come back on that. There are no boring private lawyers, Lillian. <laughs> <laughs> I could say that because Carly's next. Now, Carly, I mean, uh, the Ada Lovelace has been developing some of the wherewithal to help us get to grips with um, some of these issues, isn't it? Well, we actually put out a report a couple of weeks ago on this question of audit and assessment and um, as a kind of initial attempt to start to understand what tools are available to help us peel back the technical layer and understand the social layer that's underneath technology and, 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 and uh, scrutinise the technical decisions that have societal impacts. One of the things we, I mean, that's a very simple report. I don't want to overstate it, it, what it tries to do, which is simply to say, um, what is audit, what is assessment, and how ca might these tools be used? Um, one of the things we find, though, is that, you, you know, like, like you, Tim, I go to lots of events where people are talking about these issues in the, in the, at a high-level way about audit and how it might bring accountability and transparency. But one of the things we found is that there's no such thing as um, an audit that, you know, pre-existing AI audit that can just solve all of your problems. In order to do audit or as we call it a kind of inspection of an algorithmic system you need to have agreement about what you're inspecting it for what are the normative and regulatory um, thresholds that you're uh, scrutinizing it for you know and, and so we need to actually start to develop the meat on the bone of some of those tools and really understand what do we expect from technical systems and this is where you get into quite a lot of detail and and um, the reason I think that ethics is often used to to summarize this detail is because ethics implies there are different choices that you could make that ha would have different impacts. And some of those choices involve trade-offs and you need to make those trade-offs clear. So for example, with the contact tracing app, it may be that um, it works for most people in the UK, but it doesn't work for a small percentage of people that don't have the requisite technical capability on their phones. And then we need to really understand, well, is that, is that an acceptable compromise to make for a public sector piece of technology? Or should it have, does it have to work for everyone? Is that a minimum threshold that a contact tracing app should have to meet? Now, there's something in that decision making that does imply that, that, that there's a political decision to be made or at least a, you know, a high stakes decision. Certainly, it's not a decision that should be um, left uncommented on or left just to the technology developer. It has to be made explicit. And then we need to develop mechanisms that can go back and really monitor whether a technology is being implemented in the right way and, and go back to those original decisions. So I think that, um, you know, what I take away from, from this process of watching this app unfold is we need more and more people with different ranges of expertise becoming much more conversant in the detail of the conversations rather than the high level. And then we need to, as Pete said, work out where the expertise is and work out how to build it into the process. 
Um, audit may be one tool to do that, but we can't, we, you know, it's not, it's not a silver bullet in and of itself. It has to respond to the technical detail of the system we're talking about. Thank you very much, Carly. And then, Pete, back to you. Um, human organization um, and so on is very much uh, where you are. Um, and Carly has talked about trade offs, um, you know, uh, 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 has talked about understanding and so on. Uh, I mean, where do you think um, uh, it's not just about the, the tech, i.e., but I mean, very much uh, what Mark was saying too. I mean, where do you, how, how do we, how do we make sure that we keep tech in the proper perspective? No. Sorry, uh, it's, uh, these are very difficult questions and, you know, they are hard and we are, we are all, all grappling with them. I do think there are some reasons for optimism though, or, or, or things we can sort of take forward that are positive and useful. You know, as everybody else has said on the panel, you know, one of the problems with high level principles is not only just that they, they lose meaning the more abstracted they get, it also invites quite a gestural way of complying with them as well. It's very easy to say you're conforming to a high level principle, which is really problematic. So I think there's probably two, two thoughts really that I'd have reflected on what's been said. One is, you know, it's kind of where do you bring the scrutiny at what stage? And if we think about the way currently things are, there's obviously the ethics oversight that, that Lillian's talked about. There's the DPIA. There's a lot of front activity on the front end of, the, of these, um, of certainly this app. Um, yet there's insufficient scrutiny on the decisions that are made in the public information. Whilst there are really good people like Lillian and Gus Hussain on the ethics panel as you say it's not a regulatory body so um, to what extent do those statements on DKIAs and so on materially be held to account I know theoretically that they can be but but to what extent are they to what extent therefore can sort of less intrusive means be brought into the discussion when people can change their minds um, yeah just to echo what Mark said I think utility is, is key how can you make a judgment on whether the rights should be modified or, or limited or whether the social costs are worth it if you don't know how it's effective or how it would 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 work so a lot of that sort of at the front end but I think there's there's a lot of opportunity to think through um, ongoing review of how these things work you know Lillian mentioned that there's a process of knowledge acquisition for all of us in this debate uh, all of us are way more informed about it than we were a fortnight ago and you know we have to acknowledge that's kind of um that that's the way this this situation is unfolding so therefore how can you the more you move at pace the more scope there is for sort of arbitrary interference the more scope there is for very indirect effects that you haven't anticipated so how do we capture that and, and measure that so thinking about ongoing performance in terms of the outcomes and what actually happens whether people can report you know their experiences of the app for instance and whether that's effectively captured how we think about you know what that means for vulnerability and so on so i think there are reasons to be um to be cheerful it's just about tracing them through and having humility over where the limits of our, our knowledge and, uh, and expertise lie. Well, uh, Pete, that's a great note to end on. Reasons to be cheerful. I really, I really like that. Uh, that's almost better than boring lawyers, you know. Um, but uh, uh, I wanted to thank our panel very much indeed. It's been a fantastic conversation. Really enjoyed it. I'm going to um, uh, uh, come back just for a, a minute in a, in a second. Um, but to round off uh, the conversation, I just wanted to um, go to uh, Irena uh, Pietro Paoli, who uh, is the uh, d Director of, of uh, uh, Business and Human Rights at the uh, British Institute of International Comparative Law, um, uh, who just wants to say a few words. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Just from, from Vico Beni, thanks again to Carly Linian. Pete and Mark for the brilliant conversation, fascinating, and team, of course, for uh, leading it, also perfect timekeeping. Uh, and of course, many thanks to you for uh, participating and for uh, your question. Uh, just to let you know that the webinar has been recorded and the video, as well as the link to the material that we mentioned will be available on the um, website of Bicol. And uh, the next webinar, uh, this is an artificial um, intelligence regulation. We're going to have a next webinar on June the 2nd, um, this will focus on business and human rights. And then the third event, which will also be a conversation 
led by Lord Clement Jones uh, on artificial intelligence and more broadly uh, the future of uh, regulation is on June 22nd. Uh, more details and uh, registration will be available on the Big Call events uh, webpage uh, probably from uh, later today or tomorrow. And Tim, uh, just a few concluding words. Yes, and I think you're going to put our little slide up there, um, <laughs> if you haven't already, uh, Irena. Um, yep, here yep. we go. That's the one. And um, clearly, uh, uh, we're all grateful to the uh, BIICL. Um, and I wanted to thank um, uh, Dr. Spiros uh, Maniakis. Uh, uh, he is the inspiration behind uh, uh, the idea of these conversations. So I'm very grateful um, to him uh, as well. Um, and to Irena for all the organization. Um, but uh, do think about um, making a donation if you uh, 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 enjoyed today, because BIICL um, is a uh, not-for-profit, is a charity, um, and they can do more uh, the more support they have. So um, please do think about that. And um, a final very, very big thank you uh, to all our panelists. It's been extremely stimulating. Um, uh, we'll keep a note of all the uh, uh, Q&A uh, and feed that in. And I'm very much hoping, um, uh, uh, Irena, that we'll have some kind of summary at the end of this. But it's, um, of course, it's been a very big subject. Um, but I hope that uh, uh, there's something like 120, 130 people um, who've taken part um, have found this useful. Thank you very much indeed. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.